Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, September 15th, 2023. Just uh, first thing I want to tell you is that I have to take another day off this Sunday. I have some family business to attend to so there will be no monday show but i'll be back monday night writing and recording and i'll be sure to catch you up on anything that we missed that weekend i just wanted to put this at the top in case you didn't make it to the end of the show but anyway that's it so again i'll be back tuesday with a show for you uh but i hope you enjoy this one all right the first story at the top of antiwar.com today Zelensky is headed to the white house so Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is expected to visit Washington next week as Congress is debating the $24 billion in additional spending on the proxy war in Ukraine that the White House has requested. So the visit has not been officially announced, but it has been reported by several media outlets, including the Associated Press. Zelensky will stop in the American capital as part of his trip to the U.S. during the U.N. General Assembly. So sources told AP that Zelensky will meet with President Biden at the White House next Thursday and will also be visiting Capitol Hill. When he last made the trip to Washington in December 2022, Zelensky addressed Congress. He thanked them for the support, but he said it was not enough. So he pleaded for more military aid. And I'm sure, you know, it's not clear if he's going to give an address to Congress, but I'm sure if he does, it's going to be more of that asking for more support, even though the counteroffensive has failed. Please keep this war going. And Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials have admitted, you know, their entire war effort is entirely reliant on this support from the U.S. and NATO, primarily the U.S. So Zelensky's visit comes amid uh, lessening support for the proxy war in Ukraine among Republican voters, primarily. According to a recent poll from CNN, 55% of Americans oppose Congress authorizing more spending on the conflict, including 71% of Republicans who were asked. The majority of Republicans in Congress still favor fueling the war, but there is a loud minority in the House, mainly members of the Freedom Caucus, that could make getting the funds authorized a headache for the White House. So I think that's kind of what it's going to be. I think they are going to ultimately get this new funding. But these Republicans in the Freedom Caucus, some of them are on the Rules Committee. They can make it difficult. They can make it annoying. The White House has asked for the $24 billion in Ukraine spending as part of a $40 billion bill that includes disaster relief and money for border security. According to a report from Punchbowl News, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is considering attaching the disaster money to a continuing resolution, um, and that would separate it from the Ukraine spending, so make it a separate vote. And the report also said that he wants changes to border policy and an increase in overall border security money in return for the additional Ukraine aid. So it looks like the Republicans, or McCarthy at least, is going to try to get more spending on the border in exchange. So just more spending all around. That's what's happening here. But I do think if it wasn't from due to the pressure from these, uh, this, you know, few dozen House Republicans who are against the war in Ukraine, supporting the war in Ukraine, uh, I don't think he would be thinking about separating it or anything. He would probably just try to push it through like Mitch McConnell is over in the Senate. So it is making some difference. But again, I think ultimately it's going to, uh, The White House is going to get what they want, especially with Zelensky going there to lobby. Um, All right. So the next one here, Zelensky implies that Ukrainian refugees could resort to terror. So Zelensky implied in an interview with The Economist that Ukrainian refugees in Europe might resort to terrorism if Western aid to Ukraine is curtailed. So this is really something. And I thought I saw something about this on Twitter earlier this week. But I wasn't sure exactly where it came from, but it's from this uh, Economist report. So I'm just going to read the excerpt. So they did an interview with Zelensky, and this is them kind of paraphrasing what he said. The report reads, quote, Curtailing aid to Ukraine will only prolong the war, Mr. Zelensky argues. 
and it would create risks for the West in its own backyard. There is no way of predicting how the millions of Ukrainian refugees in European countries would react to their country being abandoned. Ukrainians have generally behaved well and are very grateful to those who sheltered them. They will not forget that generosity, but it would not be a good story for Europe if it were to drive these people into a corner, end quote. So, I mean, I don't know how you're supposed to take that as anything other but some kind of threat like these Ukrainian refugees are going to do something. Zelensky also said in the interview, which was published on September 10th, that anyone who is not with Ukraine is with Russia. Of course, if you're not with us, you're against us. He said, quote, if you are not with Ukraine, you are with Russia. And if you are not with Russia, you are with Ukraine. And if partners do not help us, it means they will help Russia to win. That is it. End quote. So despite Ukraine's faltering counteroffensive, the Ukrainian leader said he was preparing for a long war and rejected the idea of diplomacy with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The report reads, quote, Tapping loudly on the table, Mr. Zelensky rejects outright the idea of compromise with Vladimir Putin. War will continue for as long as Russia remains on Ukrainian territory, he says, end quote. So while worried about sustaining support from the West, while worried about losing that sustaining support, Zelensky said that he does not expect to lose U.S. backing if former President Trump is elected in 2024. So you have both Zelensky and Putin basically saying the same thing here, which is interesting. And we know that the Biden administration seems happy to support an open-ended conflict in Ukraine. They're not, you know, thinking about pushing for diplomacy or anything like that. They're happy to just keep this going. But still, those are some comments about the Ukrainian refugees. Again, I don't know how we're supposed to take that in any other way. Uh, All right, so the next one here, act now to save a Ukrainian peace activist from prosecution. So this is actually, this is an article from David Swanson, and he is the director of World Beyond War, which is a great anti-war group. And they have just learned that the Office of the Prosecutor and the Security Service of Ukraine have published press releases claiming to have put a stop to the activities of a guy named Yuri Shailazhenko, and they call him a vicious propagandist. And if you recognize that name, uh, we published an interview of Yuri by Marcy Winograd, who is uh, with Code Pink. And Yuri is a pacifist. He's a Ukrainian peace activist, and he's a board member of David's organization, World Beyond War. And he has opposed Russian war making from day one. He's always denounced and condemned Russia's invasion, what Russia's doing in Ukraine. But he's against fighting the war. He believes the U.S. and NATO are fueling the war, and he wants an end. He wants peace talks. So for that, he is called a vicious Russian propagandist. So Yuri has formally been charged by the Ukrainian government with the crime of justifying Russian aggression. The evidence is this statement, which explicitly condemns Russian aggression. And this is a statement that he put out for his group, the Ukrainian pacifist uh, organization, the Ukrainian pacifist movement. And again, condemning what Russia is doing, but saying they don't want to fight. They, you know, conscientious objection is a thing across, you know, you know, that is just part of, uh, you know, wars over the past few centuries, people object, and he is a conscientious objector, but for that, they want to put him in jail. So next week, Yuri will face prosecution in Kiev, and members of World Beyond War will be there to deliver a petition, and you could sign it now. If you go to the article, click the link there, or you could go to World Beyond War's website, And this asks the prosecution to be dropped. They say, if you can get to Kiev next week and support Yuri, please contact World Beyond War. And David mentions this week, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian military's territorial defense forces, Sarah Ashton Cirillo, who's an American transgender person who's a spokesman or spokesperson for the Ukrainian military, I mean, put out this really insane video and said, quote, next week, the teeth of the Russian devils will gnash even harder and their rabid mouths will foam in uncontrollable frenzy as the world will see a favorite Kremlin propagandist pay for their crimes. And this puppet of Putin is only the first. 
Russia's war criminal propagandists will all be hunted down and justice will be served, end quote. So what that is, and these videos uh, that Sarah is putting out are just insane. I, I haven't really covered it. It almost seems like surreal to me. Uh, she's called, said Russians aren't human and, and things like that. So, you know, that's a threat. What they call Russian propagandists are people who, you know, discuss the war from a realistic point of view uh, and discuss the ways that the U.S. and NATO have provoked the war and fueled the war. People like myself, even though I don't support Russia in any way, they would consider me a Russian propagandist. So that's what it is. It's a threat to kill, you know, journalists, peace activists, and people like Yuri. Um, so it's really concerning. So I think, you know, if we could all sign this petition, it might be able to help out or something and just get more attention on the scenario, you know, share this with people and let them know. I mean, what what can the Biden administration, how can they justify supporting a country and a military that's doing things like this? Um, they will to themselves, but, you know. All right. So the next one here, Ukrainian pilots complete orientation training on Swedish jets. So Sweden said Thursday that Ukrainian pilots have completed a first round of training on Swedish made Gripen fighter jets. Sweden's defense minister, Paul Johnson, told AFP, quote, the orientation training has been completed. And according to the report I received from the defense forces, the training went well, end quote. So he said the purpose of this training is to basically see how uh, test flights and simulators kind of see where the Ukrainian pilots are at, see if they could learn how to fly these jets, and to determine if Sweden can arm Ukraine with the Gripens or Gripen fighter jets. Um, so Swedish media reported this week that Sweden is considering sending these planes to Ukraine. Ukraine's been asking for them for a while. They initially ruled them out because they were worried that, that the Swedish military wouldn't have enough. But now they're considering it just another escalation of NATO involvement in the war that seems to be uh, coming. All right, so the next one here, U.S. sanctions Russia's ability to acquire tech. So this is from Connor Freeman at the Libertarian Institute. So keep in mind the story I went over yesterday that said, despite Western sanctions, Russia has doubled its production of tanks and ammunition and is producing ammunition at seven times the rate of the entire NATO alliance of the entire West, as they, you know, they call it. So this was on Thursday that the State Department and Treasury announced uh, a whole bunch of sanctions. They're going to try to sanction their way out of the sanction problem. And they're targeting Moscow's trade with some of Washington's allies and partners. The aim of the new sanctions package, one of the largest yet, is to block off Russia's access to money, financial channels, and Western technology allegedly being used to bolster the Kremlin's war effort. Among those targeted are over 150 businesses and individuals from Russia to Turkey, um, the United Arab Emirates, and Georgia. Also in the crosshairs are Russia's energy sector, including Arctic liquefied natural gas projects, mining, as well as factories repairing and manufacturing Moscow's arms. Washington penalized a recently established company in the UAE. So it's interesting, you know, going after companies in countries that they... Are the U.S. is close with, like the UAE, like Turkey, which is a, a NATO member. Of course, Turkey is a lot different than most NATO members. Um, but, yeah, again, this is just them responding to the problem that their sanctions are having with more uh, sanctions. It's hard to believe that they're going to do much. All right, so the next one here is one from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. Czech general says that NATO must prepare for a long war in Ukraine. So as Kiev's counteroffensive fails to achieve its goals, Western officials are increasingly preparing for a war of attrition in Ukraine. The Czech Republic says that it is searching its military stockpiles for more weapons to send Ukraine, and the leader of the Czech Armed Forces, Lieutenant General Karl Reika, told Reuters that the current offensive was going as expected and that he believed the war in Ukraine would stretch well into the future. He said, quote, this is how a military offensive looks. It is not like a World War II movie. It takes time. In the overall picture, I think there is currently no capacity on either side to reach their ultimate declared objectives anytime soon. It won't last a few weeks. It will last for long, probably, and it's important that we keep supporting Ukrainians for a long time, end quote. So 
you know, I think that's the attitude in a lot of these NATO countries is that they are preparing for a very long term thing here. All right, the next one, the U.S. to shift military aid from Egypt to Taiwan. So the U.S. will withhold $85 million in annual military aid to Egypt and redirect some of the funds to Taiwan. So the $85 million that the U.S. is withholding over human rights abuses is just a small portion of the $1.3 billion dollars in military aid that Egypt receives from the U.S. each year. So Egypt is a heavy hitter. Before the Ukraine debacle, they were the second highest recipient of annual military aid, second only to Israel, which was the first. Um, So the $85 million is in the form of foreign military financing, which is a State Department program that gives foreign governments money to purchase American weapons. According to CNN, Egypt receives $1 billion in foreign military financing annually, and $320 million of those funds is conditional and tied to human rights issues. So some members of Congress want President Biden to withhold the full $320 million, but for now the administration has only announced its intention to transfer $85 million. So out of that $85 million, Taiwan will get $55 million, and Lebanon will get 30 million. Lebanon, um, which is interesting. Uh, the U.S. began providing Taiwan with military aid this year, which is an unprecedented form of support in the era of normalized U.S.-China relations. Since Washington severed diplomatic relations with Taipei in 1979 to open up with Beijing, the U.S. has sold weapons to Taiwan but never financed the purchases or provided arms free of charge until this year. So this is a big deal. I kind of harp on this a lot. But, you know, this is one of the things that could provoke a war with China over Taiwan is this increasing support. Um, So last month, the U.S. approved the first ever foreign military financing package for, for Taiwan. That was worth $80 million. In July, the Biden administration provided Taiwan with a weapons package using the presidential drawdown authority for the first time, and that allows Biden to send weapons directly from U.S. military stockpiles. And it's the primary way that he's been arming Ukraine. And the PDA package for Taiwan was worth $345 million. We don't know what they're sending Taiwan. They're not disclosing it. Um, But yeah, and this aid has really angered China as Beijing opposes all forms of U.S. military support for the island. Arms sales and especially this new type of support through the military aid and the next one here chinese military holds major drills in the western pacific so china has been conducting major military drills in taiwan or sorry near taiwan and other areas of the western pacific in an effort to push back against the increasing u.s activity in the region The Chinese People's Liberation Army's Shandong aircraft carrier was one of the 20 naval vessels that was spotted participating in the exercises in the region since Tuesday. Taiwan's defense ministry said that it it detected 68 PLA warplanes and 10 PLA naval vessels in the area from 6 a.m. Wednesday to 6 a.m. Thursday. And this is the most that they've detected within a 24-hour period this year. So if you're watching, this is the release that the Taiwanese Defense Ministry put out. And these ships and planes entered an area that is known as Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone, which is not uh, anything like airspace. Sometimes we see this falsely reported in Western media as Chinese planes or ships entering Taiwan's airspace. It's not uh, airspace extends 12 miles off Taiwan's coast. And then they have the contiguous zone, which extends 24 miles off Taiwan's coast. And we have not seen Chinese ships or planes enter within that 24 mile zone. Um, They've come close at certain times, according to Taiwan. But anyway, this gives you an idea of the large amount of Chinese military activity that's going on in the area. So according to the South China Morning Post, the PLA's Eastern Theater Command said that its pilots were taking part in long-distance cross-theater exercises to practice landing and taking off from unfamiliar airports, end quote. So Zhu Shenming, who's a researcher from a Beijing-based military think tank, said that the drills would become routine. 
So Zhu said, quote, like the island encirclement patrol, cross theater drills have become routine, taking place in the Taiwan Strait and Western Pacific. This this is part of combat readiness training to prepare for the outbreak of a Taiwan contingency, end quote. And the island encirclement patrol that he's talking about, that started after, uh, you know, that started when Nancy Pelosi went there in August 2022, which provoked China's largest ever live fire military drills around Taiwan. So there could be more aircraft involved in these drills than the ones tracked by Taiwan because Beijing's J-20 stealth fighters were involved. And they cannot be tracked by Taiwan's radars. A source close to the PLA told the South China Morning Post that the deployment of J-20s was a response to the U.S.'s deployment of hundreds of F-35 planes to the region. So China's major drills came after a series of U.S. exercises in the region, including drills with Australia, Japan, and the Philippines in the South China Sea exercises with Indonesia, and a joint U.S.-Canadian transit of the Taiwan Strait. This is all being done. The U.S. is increasing its military activity, building alliances, opening new bases, giving Taiwan military aid. They're doing this in the name of deterrence, but these Chinese drills are showing us that deterrence is clearly not working. All they're doing is bringing a heavier Chinese military presence to the region and making war more likely. It's very clear to anybody that can follow along, Um, you know, that's just the reality of the situation. And, you know, I try not to be like hyperbolic or anything, but, you know, at this point, I mean, even though it might seem completely uh, far off, you know, if one day we wake up and find out China blockaded Taiwan, just, you know, because they were fed up, you know, we shouldn't be surprised is all I would say. Um. So the next one here, the U.S. considers moving drone base from Niger. So the commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe and Africa told reporters on Wednesday that the U.S. is considering moving its drone base in Niger following the July 26 coup that ousted President Mohamed Bazoum. So this is General James Hecker. He said, quote, there are several locations I'll say that we're looking at, but nothing's firmed up. We have talked to some countries about it, end quote. So America's main drone base in Niger, known as Air Base 201, costs $110 million to build and $20 million to $30 million each year to maintain, according to The Intercept's Nick Terse, who focuses on U.S. military operations in Africa. Air Base 201 is the linchpin of the U.S. military's archipelago of bases in North and West Africa and a key part of America's wide-ranging intelligence, surveillance, and security efforts in the region. So Hecker also said that the Air Force was waiting to see how diplomacy with the post-coup government plays out. He said that a diplomatic solution is going pretty well right now. We still haven't seen any military intervention from ECOWAS or France or anything like that. But there there are also signs that the U.S. would be willing to stay and just cooperate with the post-coup government. There's been media reports that said that. Um, the Biden administration has yet to formally label the situation in Niger a coup, which would re- require the U.S. to cut off all military assistance. CNN reported last month that the U.S. was considering issuing a waiver if it declared a coup to continue U.S. military operations in the country. Uh, And there's about 1,100 U.S. troops stationed in Niger. So U.S. military flights were initially grounded in Niger after the coup, but Hecker said most operations have resumed at this point. The Pentagon said on Thursday they said that the U.S. has only resumed surveillance flights and not counterterrorism operations like some people have said. Um, So we'll see again how this whole Niger situation plays out. Hopefully there's not a big war, but... And it does seem like uh, it doesn't seem like the ECOWAS intervention is imminent, so they might be able to work something out. Um, so that's it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Matthew Petty: The Abraham Accords are no victory for religious tolerance. One from Ramsey Baroud: The untold story of the abuse of Palestinian women in Hebron. One from Ryan McMacken: America since 9/11, 22 years of lies and despotism. 
and one from Marjorie Cohn, the U.S. is fanning the flames of war with China, one from Blaise Malley, will Congress support blank check for Ukraine? Um, and that is everything. That's it for me for the week. And just a reminder, I have to take another day off uh, Sunday. So there's not going to be a Monday show. Just got some family business I need to attend to. Uh, but I'll be back. You know, I'll make sure to update you on everything. And, you know, sorry I've been taking a lot of days off, but I got a lot going on. Uh, but anyway, I'll be back after a long weekend. I hope everybody has a good one. I appreciate everyone that's listening and commenting and sharing the show and emailing me and engaging. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to have so many people listening to this show. But that's it for me. I'll talk to you in a few days. Thanks for listening.